Kenya TV Friday. Today we share part three of our three-part series with distinguished professor Anne Fitzgerald, director of the Bosili School of International Affairs, professor of international security at Wilfrid Laurier University, senior security and justice advisor and writer. Director Fitzgerald is an expert on the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia, where she has over 20 years of research and experience. In part one, we shared a brief overview of where we are in Ethiopia's conflict with a look at preliminary steps to peace talks between Ethiopia's government and the TPLF. In part two, Professor Anne Fitzgerald and Salome Mulageta discussed the origin of the Ethiopian conflict, sanctions and TPLF's prioritization of warfare over humanitarian aid, international response to the war in Ukraine compared to the war in Ethiopia and more. In this session with Dr. Fitzgerald, part three, we share a more in-depth look at Walkite, including its history and ownership. We take a look at suggestions for peace in Ethiopia and discuss what Ethiopians want. Ethiopian American and Eritrean American filmmaker, journalist, actor and storyteller Salome Mulugeta speaks with Professor Fitzgerald from the perspective of a filmmaker, a storyteller and journalist. Let's join Professor Anne Fitzgerald and Salome Mulugeta. So Anne, if you had to sum up with what's going on in Ethiopia for people who may not know, what would you say is going on in Ethiopia currently? I would say that the data suggests that the conflict in northern Ethiopia has been based on a clear strategic aim and a well-planned campaign by the TPLF to overthrow the government and take back power, and that a well-coordinated, well-planned, and a very well-resourced disinformation and misinformation strategy cemented a false narrative on the conflict particularly in the absence of federal government-led uh, communications. That the real truth did not inform policy and that policy decisions taken by a number of external actors have not, on the whole, uh, been good ones. And this has left a deeply damaging situation for Ethiopia, not just Ethiopia, but the Horn of Africa. And uh, I should add that the situation has... Uh, impacted Eritrea and Eritreans around the world as well, uh, but also for the African continent, uh, because it's exposed some very worrying trends about the extension of foreign policy interests into certain subregions and um, the willingness to cooperate and work with uh, groups that commit uh, what was uh, a, 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 a hideous crime to murder so many federal forces, troops, right at the beginning of the conflict. So this narrative needs to be corrected and it needs to start with the truth. We can't go backwards, but we can certainly move forwards by observing and acting on the basis of norms, norms that are followed in healthy international relations, diplomacy, and democratic governance. And we're seeing signs that that sort of conduct and behavior is now unfolding. Um, but clarity on what is unfolding is absolutely required as well. So uh, I think the missing piece in all of this is, is regular briefings from government just to keep the people moving forward with them. And that is the situation we find ourselves with um, at the strategic level and at the overall level in Ethiopia. What about the issue with the Walkais area? You know, there are some discussion about the TPLF interest to take that part of Ethiopia in order to have independence from Ethiopia. Is that true? Um, what do you know about Wilkite? Can you explain and elaborate about that? And also, whenever Wilkite is addressed in the U.S., they always, always refer to it as Western Tigray. Why is that? 
Yeah, it's interesting. This notion of Western Tigray um, became popularized as a result of the conflict. You know, we 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 we, we know that um, wall kite exists in northwestern Ethiopia. That um, it, it it has an ancient history itself. Uh, its natural border has always been the Tekeza River. Uh, mm -hmm. We also know that it's it's really the umbilical cord of this whole uh, conflict. Um, it's 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 like a port for the TPLF. It's it's like getting us access to Asab or Masawa. Um, the TPLF crossed the Tekezi River in in 1991 when its insurgency campaign was in full force to overthrow the, the military regime. And it landed in Walkite, it landed there, and at the time it wasn't hugely controversial because um, you know, the Walkite didn't particularly like the military regime either. But then things started getting worse and worse and worse, and, and, and the Walkite people were, were persecuted over the years. And um, the, you know, strategically, it, it represents a great deal. I mentioned access to, to the ports. It's a gateway to the waters of the Blue Nile. Um, once access is gained to Walkite, uh, the TPLF would gain access to the Blue Nile all the way down to Lake Tana and through the Sudanese borders to Walega. Um, so the gateway is, is absolutely crucial. Okay. Uh, it's extremely fertile as an area, area. It's very moist. It gets rain. It's on the monsoon side of the Gulf of Guinea. So very fertile. And um, so the, the three things, ports, gateways, and the water shares of the Nile are, are, are geostrategically very important. As to the ownership of, of Walkite, um, there's a very good book uh, written by uh, Achavala Tamaru, and he is an Ethiopian economist from Gojam, and he wrote, wrote a book called Walkite uh, Gadai, The Affairs of Walkite. Um, he documented primary and secondary research beginning right from the fourth century to 1991, showing historical records in, in G's, in, in French language, in Italian. It was extensive, it was well footnoted, well documented. Um, uh, another author, a uh, French author, wrote a very, very good piece looking over 200 years at Walkite, Arno Michel Dabadi. Um, so, all of these records show that the Tekezi River was always a natural border. We also know um, from statistics and national census data that in 1991, 83% of uh, the people residing in that area spoke Amharic, okay. uh, identified themselves as uh, they were Walkite, but they belonged to Amhara. So it's not just a political question, it's an identity issue here and a case of what I would call historical justice. Okay. Um, and it's very sensitive at the moment for all sorts of reasons, not least of which concerns the recent Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International report that was published um, and, 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 and put some very dubious figures in uh, concerning the population and the Tigrayan, uh, ethnic Tigrayan component of that population. If you go back and you check the population, um, uh, like I said, of Gondar in 1991, 83% of the people were Amhara and Amharic speaking. Now this was based on the census that the military regime had done so some time ago. The last official uh, census was in 2007, I believe, and uh, in 2017, the unofficial census included projections, and each year was based on uh, projections that, that the rest of the country were also subjected to. 
Um, and lastly, another notable statistic was in 2021, February 2021, uh, UN OCHA, the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, cited the EPRDF's 2017 census report, claiming that there was a total population in the region of, in the whole region of what they deemed as Western Tigray, of 467, just short of 468,000. And yet, 10 months later, on December 2nd, 2021, the same UN agency, OCHA, produced another report and said that 1.2 million Tigrayans were displaced from Western Tigray. So despite the 2017 official census data, which were How can that be such a big difference in the number? Well, and that, that 2017 official census data reported 315, just over 315,000 people. Uh, the, the Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch report, I think, reported that um, over 774,000 Tigrayans were forcibly displaced from the same region. So the numbers are all over the place and, and there, there's a lack of logic behind these numbers based on the uh, baseline population and based on the projections. So it's, you know, if, if, if I look at what's happened in my own country, Canada, concerning historical justice about uh, critical identity issues, um, we have many indigenous groups across the country, uh, some of which were tragically persecuted um, many years ago. Uh, this is a historical issue, a social justice issue, a historical justice issue, um, because their identity also belonged to the land. Right. that they occupied and that they founded and that they nurtured through the years and that they identified with. So before any event or any official address happens in Canada, the traditional territory is acknowledged and the people of that traditional territory are also acknowledged. So. Here at the Balsili School of International Affairs, we sit on the traditional territory, the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. They were the tribes that founded the land. This land belongs to them, and we're extremely privileged and proud to be on it. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that. That is a form of historical justice that is owed to them. And I think it is very similar to what's happened in in Walkite. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a strong acknowledgement that um, Walkite is the umbilical cord to the country at the moment. And depending on which way discussions on Walkite go, and of course, it's being administered now by the Amhara regional state. Uh, but I should say what's What's less than ideal is the lack of clarity that's been announced on it. Um, and whereas we understand that, uh, you know, de definitive decisions perhaps cannot be articulated, there have been a difference in the lines given on Walkite, and it's left a bit of confusion. So clarity needs to be given on Walkite. And... Um, by the by the prime minister of ethiopia or yes okay. and uh you know some empirical evidence has to be used to justify whatever decision according to democratic norms and due process and historical and identity justice needs to support that okay what do you your view is what is your view in terms of for the for the country to have peace what do you think uh needs to happen 
Well, I think the people need to speak. I think the people, particularly the people of Tigray, two million approximately of whom live outside of Tigray, uh, it should be recalled, we need to hear their voice. They have been used to a model of vanguard politics, which is that the people work for the party rather than the party works for the people. A democracy and democratic politics cannot function according to even an element of vanguard politics within the, the system. It's totally incompatible with the direction of the Prosperity Party. However, in a federal system, you can have what's called asymmetric federalism. For instance, here in Canada, the province of Quebec has different pension laws, different labor laws than the province of Ontario. And that's what we call the asymmetrism of um, federalism. But then you have things that are non-negotiable and must be federal uh, right. for very good reasons and equally applied throughout your regional states, or in our case here in Canada, our provinces. So there's, of course, room to bring a regional approach to federal politics, but the principles underpinning that approach, which must be, for a democracy, a healthy democracy, democratic norms, and a party working for the people, has to be in place. And that is incompatible with the TPLF's ideology. So I think the best situation would be for a moderate group of TPLF leaders to engage with their prosperity party brothers and sisters and to engage in peace talks and to acknowledge what is necessary for peace. Um, it's, it's, it's not a negotiation. It shouldn't be a negotiation. I mean, the federal government of Canada would never negotiate with, with a, a, a provincial government because the federal government takes precedent. It Trump, like it, it presides over the country. Right. It's like the UN in, in, in a way, right? Yeah, it would enter dialogue and it would yeah. hear the voices of the province. But it wouldn't, right. wouldn't go, to, to go to a negotiating table with them. Right. So, you know, we have to, I think, be realistic in the kind of processes and models that can be taken forward. Uh, the issues can be put on the table. Um, in some cases, swords might be fallen upon with some difficult issues. Uh, in other cases, for a federal government, issues may not be negotiable. And you know, a happy landing would have to be agreed on because precedent is really important. So, you, you, you know, any processes you take on in a governance framework in a country have to be reproducible, have to be repeatable. And so we have to just be careful as, Dem I shouldn't say we, democratic governments, have to be careful that they demonstrate to the people that what they do in one area of a country can be done in any area of the country. And so the, the government has to be in the driver's seat here. I'm and sorry, say again? Just that. The government has to be in the driver's seat. Yes. It, 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 it was voted in through a legitimate democratic election. It is a legitimate authority. It is willing to hear voices. It has showed willingness to um, make good gestures and respond to pressures from the international community of various sorts. But for very good reasons, there are things that uh, a government won't compromise. Right. And that is you know, uh, including other things, its commitment to the safety, security, and stability of its people, its borders, and its sovereignty. And last but not least, what do you think Ethiopians want? 
peace. <laughs> Ethiopians <laughs> are tired of war. Ethiopians just want um, decent communications. I think everybody's acknowledged that the government has not been at all optimal. In fact, it's less than optimal. It's been very weak at its strategic communications. Communications and information are a national instrument of power, and they have to proceed as such. So um, Ethiopians want information. And the information doesn't have to be hugely detailed. They just want uh, engagement. And they want some sort of clarity on different issues that the lack of which at the moment is creating a rumor mill that is multidimensional and unhelpful. So Ethiopians, I would say, if I can, um, in this very privileged platform, speak on their behalf for a moment, they want information, they want peace, they want um, peace for their region, not just for their country. There's a huge potential in Ethiopia that is unexplored. I mean, even before the conflict broke out, we saw um, new agricultural technology and environmental programs enable three harvests a year instead of one harvest. The impact on the economy that that should be having is, is, is huge and should be huge. But because Tigray is an important part of that process as well and um, contributes in different ways to that and other processes in keeping with a federal system, um, we need Tigray engaged with these processes. And so I think Ethiopians just want to see the country back up and running again. The diaspora want to keep on investing in the country and keep on returning home and visiting and helping Ethiopians gain opportunities abroad um, and, and see Ethiopia rich, uh, reach its, its rich potential, um, you know, bring peace to the wider Horn region, allow investment, um, help the continent pivot to a greener, cleaner type of economic um, solutions with less foreign intervention and with more foreign partnerships, healthy partnerships, partnerships that are based on principles like, you know, decency, fairness, um, uh, mutual respect, and uh, mutual progress. So I hope I'm, I'm, speaking fairly on, on uh, behalf of Ethiopians, um, I think that Ethiopians would also like to see a new constitution and not a constitution based on divide and rule framework. Um, you know, Ethiopians should be able to move freely no matter what area they live in, in the country, and live wherever they want, and not be framed according to an identity on a card. Um, they are Ethiopians and the whole country belongs to them. I hope so. I hope we come to some kind of agreement where we find peace and, you know, and freedom. And I thank you for this. Uh, and The American Ethiopian Public Affairs Committee, APAC, extends an invitation to join them for a get-together dinner's reception on Friday, July 8th at 6 p.m. at the Doubletree Hotel in Silver Springs, Maryland. General admission is $100 and $1,000 for sponsors. Tickets can be purchased at APAC.org, A-E-P-A-C-T dot org. In this segment, we highlight some of the current events in and around Ethiopia and Eritrea. The names of seven members of the team responsible for Ethiopia's peace process with the TPLF have been released. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs Demeki Makonin will chair the committee. 
Other members include Ethiopia's Minister of Justice, the National Intelligence and Security Director General, Military Intelligence, and Deputy President of the Amhara Regional State, Dr. Getachao Jemba. On Sunday, June 26th, Sudan accused Ethiopia of killing seven of its soldiers and a civilian. On Monday, Ethiopia denied Sudan's accusation, stating that the facts of the incident were falsified and that the incident resulted from a staged skirmish between local militia and Sudanese soldiers. The Ethiopian government called on the government of Sudan to de-escalate the incident in order to maintain peace in the region. Thank you for watching. Please share the story and our other stories. Like with a thumbs up and subscribe today by clicking the subscription button below to be in the know with Hello Ethiopia Stories, your channel for English, Ethiopian and Eritrean news, art, culture, history and entertainment. Subscribe and play our HETV subscription referral competition. Details in the description. Join us on this Friday for what's happening in Ethiopia. Don't forget to subscribe, like and share. The American Ethiopian Public Affairs Committee, APAC, extends an invitation to join them for a get-together dinner reception on Friday, July 8th at 6 p.m. at the Doubletree Hotel in Silver Springs, Maryland. General admission is $100 and $1,000 for sponsors. Tickets can be purchased at apact.org. A-E-P-A-C-T.org.